Welcome to this Asia Global podcast, brought to you by the Asia Global Institute at the University of Hong Kong. I am your host, Alejandro Reyes, the Institute's Director of Knowledge Dissemination. In our programs here in Hong Kong and online, and in the content that we produce, we focus on presenting Asian perspectives on global issues. This podcast is part of our Meet the Author series, where we have a conversation with contributors to Asia Global Online and other publications of the Institute. Joining me now from the United States is entrepreneur Shai Rashef, the founder and president of the University of the People. Founded in 2009, the University of the People is the first and only nonprofit tuition free. U.S. accredited online university. Shai, welcome. Thank you for joining us. Thank you for inviting me. I'm very happy to be here. Yes, it's wonderful to see you. Now, in your article that's trending on Asia Global Online, you write that education has been one of the victims of the coronavirus pandemic. Given the inherent threat of infection from students and staff, returning to schools and colleges, countries around the world must rethink the online learning model. That's what you argue. You liken the pandemic to a tsunami rising to hit a beachfront house where the residents are reluctant to flee, arguing that, you know, we've been here for decades, so we can handle this big wave. And you conclude that governments and institutions have to preserve and cultivate, and I like those words, preserve and cultivate their online systems. What exactly do you mean, this key message of your article? Sure. So you, you described, it, described it right. Uh, when the pandemic happened, uh, most universities closed their doors and moved online. But opening a Zoom account and start broadcasting on Zoom, this is not online. Online, this is online, but it's not online learning. Online learning has a pedagogy. If you want it to succeed, you need to build courses that will be effective online. You need to make the students interactive. The, the course is interactive and you have to make, to make the students involved. It's not coming, giving a lecture two hours a week, sending the students away and expect them to learn the material. They need to interact with the professor more than once a week, among themselves more than once a week. So it should be a discussion between the students and the professor. So it's, it's a whole pedagogy that should, happen, that should happen out of there. I think that uh, in large cases, in, may, in, may, in most cases, universities were not prepared, but this is okay because they had no choice. But a lot of universities felt like, okay, it's one time and, and life will go back to normal. Well, it's, we are already half a year into the pandemic and things are not back to normal and nobody sees when or can predict when life will be back to normal. So we, we should think of a different, different uh, situation, situation where social distancing will be there. If social distancing will be there, Campus life will not be the same. If students cannot come to the campus, if students cannot go out to the library, if they cannot go and, and, and socialize among mm. themselves, this is not the regular, the regular life of the day. That's not campus life. So we should build a different, a different system. But I think it goes into another aspect mm. as well. The world is entering into recession. I'm not sure that everyone realizes it, and I definitely don't think that higher education institutions are, are, are realizing it. And it has two major consequences. First of all, a lot of students will not be able to afford higher education because their parents lose their jobs. We're talking about mm. tens, percent, huge percentage of people being unemployed. If you're unemployed, you cannot afford going back to school you need to go back to school because you need you need new new profession, but you cannot afford it. Moreover, you cannot afford sending your kids to school, which means that universities will lose a lot of students. We see what happened right now with international students. And when you look at, at the American university, 
large part of their revenues are coming from foreign students. Well, they're not coming anymore. What do you do? Then there is budget cut by governments. Governments and states in the US, but all over the world, cut budgets because it's a recession time. And in recession time, you need to cut budget. Where do you cut? Well, in many places, it will be higher education. Look what happened in the UK 20 years ago. Higher education was free in the UK. Now it's about te almost 10,000 pounds a year per student. It just, the tuition grows and grows mm. and the government is going to cut more the budget and it will happen everywhere. Well, I'm thinking now about the universities that their budget is being cut and they need to cut their budget by 10%. Can they make it? I'm not sure that they can make it. So they will need to adjust. And I'm saying that, that it's going to be a turmoil and they need, they need to change in order to survive. So it's a different world. So, so in, in fact, you, you talk about a bit of the de denial that's going on and, and that you, uh, uh, a lot of these universities are actually increasing um, their tuition and some saying that they reserve the right to, uh, to adjust their, their prices, as it were. Um, is that going to sort of consolidate the market very quickly, you think? Uh, or, or, or will we see some, I mean, you talk about how you see the higher education sector evolving into sort of three groups. So universities are in denial. And you know, a friend of mine got, a, got an email from the registrar of the university saying, listen, we still don't know if we will teach online or offline. We still things are not clear, but we can assure you that we are not going to, to reduce the price. So he looked at the price, and actually the price is 3.5% more than it was last year, so right. they're increasing wow. the price. Yes. But people cannot, cannot pay for it, and a lot of people say, wait a second, I'm not having any, any more any services. All I'm getting is two hours a week of Zoom. Should I pay 50,000 US dollars a year for that? So a lot of people talking about the gap here. And I think so, so the, the system is going to be shaped. And when I look and, and when I look into the future, I think that there will be three kinds of universities. Once are, you know, and, and, and I'm talking about the US system and it will be everywhere. The top universities, when you look at Harvard, you know, if Harvard will come tomorrow and say, guys, I want to charge a million dollars a year in order to study mm -hmm. in yes. with Harvard. Believe it or not, there will be enough people that will be willing to pay wow, a million yes. dollars a year just to have the double <laughs> title on their name. Then the other side will be universities like us, like University of the People, tuition-free, quality education, that actually you get great, um, great value for your money, quality education with a fraction of a price of, of the top universities. My argument is that all the universities in the world will need to decide if I'm not the top one and not the bottom one, where am I in the spectrum? And the spectrum will be, will be, you know, some universities you will come and say, I want to study in my local university, to study with my friends, guarantee that I'll find job where, where I study. So I'm willing to pay to study in a local university. Well, what's the price for it? Because you have tuition free. I'm willing to pay more in order to study in my localities, but how much is it? I want to study Greek. And this is the, and I have, uh, my university is the best university in the world to teach ancient Greek. And that's what I want, I want to study. Well, okay. How much am I willing to pay for this university? I don't know. But universities will have to find, first of all, have to find what's unique about them, what make them special. And what's the price point? So it become a commodity, right? Different, different offering with different, with different uh, prices. So I think that universities will have to adapt. Some universities will have to merge because they don't have any added value. And the only way for them to survive is to, is to merge with other universities. Other universities will have to go online will, and, and lower their price dramatically. Other will have hybrid, half online and half uh, face-to-face uh, -face and have a different price point. So I think that the world is going to, to, uh, to be shaped. I think, you know, we, we, we offered universities to go the first year online. 
that was one of the offers that we gave. Because if you go online, tuition free online, you tell the students, listen, take my courses first year tuition free, pay only and come to me, come to, to the university for only for two or three years spending on, on the university, save at this part of the cost. So by that, you lower the price to the students by one third mm. or one fourth, depending on the, the system. And for the university, we're telling if you're a selective university, take more students for the remaining years so you will preserve your, your uh, revenues and, and you will succeed. But things must change. You need to see uh, what makes you unique, how you survive in a future which is not going to be the same as it was. I love your example because my one of my brothers uh, teaches ancient Greek at uh, secondary okay. school and university. <laughs> so it's a it's a great example that really speaks to me. Now um, I'm wondering if you could talk a little bit about University of the People because uh, you already mentioned uh, some about aspects of um, of, of UOP. Um, and you know when I when I first met you last year at a lunch and we sat together and and you described um, uh, University of the People, it really blew my mind. Um, I'm wondering if you tell us a little bit about how you came to uh, start University of the People and 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 what's sort of the mission of it. So I was involved in for-profit education for over twenty years, and I was in charge of a new tens of educational programs for, for hundreds of thousands of students uh, from kindergarten actually to university level. And at one point we decided to open the first online university in Europe. And it was through partnership with the University of Liverpool and we deliver University of Liverpool online degree or degrees online. And that's where I saw how powerful online learning can be because we had students from Hong Kong staying at home, keeping their job, jobs, and still get University of Liverpool education. At the same time, I also saw that for most people, it was nothing but a wishful thinking because it was too expensive. I ended up, it was for profit. I sold this uh, university and uh, I went into semi-retirement just to realize that I want to continue. So I looked around and I realized that everything that made this University of Liverpool online is so expensive is available for free. Open source technology, open educational resources, content that professors produce and put online for the rest of the world to use for free. And the new internet phenomena were People were willing to teach and learn from each other for free. And they said, if we have te free technology, free content, and professors that are willing to teach for free, all I have to do is to put it together and create a tuition-free university. So I did. I, I announced it in a conference in uh, Munich. The next day, the New York Times wrote a page about it. And the following day, I already had hundreds of emails from professors who uh, wrote me and said, this is a great idea. We want to make it happen. And they made it happen. So, yeah. so the idea of the university is to, uh, to open the gates of higher education to every single person who deserve higher education and cannot do it, either because it's too expensive, either because they live in countries where there aren't enough universities, there aren't enough seats available, either because politically they are deprived from higher education and refugees would be the great example, or because culturally, you know, women in some countries are not welcome to higher education. And we said, let's use the internet to bring education to them, tuition free. So we started in 2009. Uh, we created American uh, University. Uh, we received our accreditation in 2014. Since then, we, at that point, we had 500 students. Since then, we double every year. Uh, so we started with 500 in 2014. By now, we have 36,000 students. Wow. And we, are, we see ourselves doubling next year as well. We just announced uh, three days ago a, a university in Arabic 
mainly for refugees in the Middle East who cannot attend higher education. And we, we are there for these people. We only offer degrees that are um, relevant to help our students find a job. Business administration, computer science, and health science, associate and bachelor degree, as well as MBA and master in education in collaboration with the IB, International Baccalaureate. Um, we run to large extent by, re by uh, volunteers um, and we are very happy with what we do. <laughs> and, and these volunteers are, are, are professors at some of the really top universities around. Yeah, uh, our, our uh, president's council, that's our top academic leadership, chaired by John Sexton, the president, the former president of NYU, and it uh, includes presidents, uh, current and former presidents of Oxford, uh, Berkeley, Columbia, um, McGill, um, Edinburgh. So we have uh, great professors from great uh, universities. You can go to our website, uh, uopeople.edu and see who is there. Our provost is from Columbia University. Our deans are from NYU and Princeton. So we have great people who jumped on board because so many people believe, as we believe, that higher education should be a basic right for all. And if you want a better world, education is the way to do it. So if you give people education, you give them future. You give them, and you, it's not only help, helping them, you're helping them, their families, their communities, their countries, and eventually the world. So the more people being educated, the better world we have. And, and you know, UNESCO stated that there are 100 million people who don't have seats in the existing universities. You know, online is the way to do it. And that's yes. what we do. And we, will, we do it for the students, but also to show others, governments as well as universities, that education can be large, large scale at a fraction of the price that it is right now. Now, one aspect of, um, that I found very interesting is, of course, when, when, whenever you talk about something that's going online, people say, oh, well, then what about the digital divide? You need uh, broadband and it'll be very But actually, yours, any kind of internet connection uh, works uh, so, for the University of People. Thank you for asking it because it's a very it's a very good question. When we started in two thousand nine, we decided that uh, we want to make sure that anyone with any internet connection can study with us. Therefore, um, first of all, two things. First of all, it's asynchronous, meaning you can study from any from anywhere you are at any time. And second, you don't need broadband; it's all text based. So the courses are text-based. You can you go online anytime you anytime you want from anywhere you are. So you can go from your home, from your office, from internet cafe, from your cell phone, from laptop, from a, a tablet, any internet connection that you have, and you can study with us. You can download the material. Actually, one of our first students that I uh, that ended up through our articulation agreement with NYU, ended up in NYU Abu Dhabi, a um, great student. Uh, he, following the earthquake in Haiti, uh, he didn't have um, internet. He had a computer, a laptop that, that his uncle actually gave him. So what he did, he used to go to internet cafe every other day, download the material from the, the class, go home, work, and then go back to the internet cafe two days later, uh, submit what he did, download what other people do, and that's, that's how it works. So you don't need it. Lately, we realize that by um, having text only, in a way we are so-called punishing our students who do have broadband because they can't enjoy the, the richness right. of the internet. So what we did, we started introducing video as an option. So you can go to the class, you can, uh, if you have internet, if you have broadband, we send you to the video to watch. If you don't have video, you still have the text. So we try to, to answer it for both ways. By the way, while 
Uh, you don't need um, broadband to study. If you have and you want to interact with other students through Skype or other uh, video uh, method, you're welcome to do that. So we give you the option of both, of both worlds, yeah. Now also, uh, in terms of the cost, um, you know, as I say, tuition free, but uh, if you want to take the exams, there is a small cost, right? But it's very, right. very low. This is also because, because it's important to mention. We are tuition free, which means that uh, you don't need to pay for the textbooks, you don't need to pay for your, uh, for your course, but when, um, when you go into the, when you get to the final exam, we have um, um, exam fees or assessment fee, which is actually turn out to be soon $120 per each end of course exam, which means that a full BA will cost you $4,800 for the entire four years. If you study for MA, either MBA or Master in Education, it's two hundred forty for a a pair course, uh, still a fraction of the price, obviously, of any other university, but yes. it is, uh, but that's what cover our, our costs. And it is important because we are trying to be financially sustainable from these small fees. Um, while we do always need donations uh, for scholarships and for developing new programs, it is very important for us that our operation will be sustainable from these fees because First of all, we don't want to be dependent on donations for our existence, but also we want to show the world how quality higher education can be at a fraction of a price of other universities and still be a financially sustainable, the operation without support of governments or donations for its existence. Now, something as innovative as this, surely you encountered a lot of uh, resistance, cynicism, disbelief. Um, what were some of the key challenges that uh, you found that you had to overcome? I mean, what, what was the particularly most difficult challenge? Well, I, I would start answering, but by, by talking about the skepticism that we encountered when we first launched the university. And a lot of people were skeptical and they said, no university in the world can lean on volunteers. And if it leans on volunteers, it will never be accredited. And if it will be accredited, it won't be financially sustainable. So, you know, we proved one by one that uh, online university, tuition free, uh, can rely on volunteer, can be accredited and can be, can be sustainable. Um, but you know, I think that um, I would say I, I would divide the answer into into two two um, a different kind of different answers. First of all, the thing that surprised me most after announce, announcing the university is the goodwill that is out to them. You know, I, I mentioned it earlier. I announced the university and I said, you know, I want to build a university that will rely on volunteers, but I didn't know how, my, how many volunteers will jump on board. We have by now over 17,000 volunteers. So the amount of goodwill that is out there and goodwill either by professors, people who are teach, our, our instructors are volunteers, our top academic leadership are volunteers. Uh, so we have so many people who volunteer to help us make this dream come true, uh, either by, by working with us, by developing the courses, by teaching, or by supporting us financially. So this is one thing that, that surprised me. I think that saying that, um, the main challenge that we had from the very beginning uh, is spreading the word. You know, I'm still surprised when I'm walking on the street. Well, these days you don't walk a lot on the streets no. because of the pandemic. But when you, when you encounter someone new and said, I'm from University of the People, and said, oh, I've heard of them. I'm being surprised because most people haven't heard about us. And definitely, definitely so the students. So, you know, 
we are there to serve those who have no other other opportunities. We have now three thousand uh, refugees that uh, are studying with us. Two thousand of them are Syrian, and now we're opening a new university in Arabic for uh, for those refugees and for others. But most refugees haven't heard about us. So yes. spreading the word. Uh, has been a challenge and still is a challenge. Most people haven't heard about us. Uh, the second thing that comes with it is um, having enough um, scholarships for uh, those who cannot afford even the minimal uh, fees that, we, that we're charging. And making sure that we have enough enough scholarships is, is a challenge because it's, you know, it's our mission that nobody would be left behind for financial reasons. And if you don't have the... the enough money to pay for the fees, we want to give you scholarship. We don't have enough scholarship. So that's a constant uh, challenge that we have as well. Um, but I guess that, so these are the main challenges. Uh, I would say that, um, you know, managing growth is, is a challenge by itself because doubling, not a lot of companies and no university that I know double themselves every year yeah. and making sure that you have the manpower that you have the knowledge that you have the capacity uh, to serve and be ready for the growth is something always challenging but so far we're dealing with it very well now can i ask you a bit about your background i i found very interesting that you have a master's degree in chinese studies I, i'm wondering if you just say well you know that seems quite uh, an unusual uh Credential. Uh, how, how did you come to be interested in, in Chinese studies? So, you know, I, when I did my undergraduate, I uh, took a course about uh, modern Chinese politics, basically going through uh, what China has gone through since starting from the, um, actually from the beginning of the 20th century. And I was fascinated. I, th I think that uh, China is a fascinating country. Uh, I think that um, what it has gone through from, you know, from <laughs> being taken by, from, you know, from, from the long history, fascinating history to the modern age, to being uh, taken by uh, all the imperialist countries and then the Chinese revolution and, and the aftermath of the, of it, you know, China is a country that they've gone through a lot. And I felt like, you know, the world should know more about it. And uh, I felt like most of the world don't know China and don't, you know, you read the news and you read what's happening today, but not really about how fascinating this country is. And I think that the world can study a lot from the uh, Chinese history and, uh, and especially the modern history. And I felt like I want to learn more. So I decided to to do my MA in uh, Chinese politics. And uh, I think I learned a lot from it. So it was pure interest and uh, no, I'm very happy that I did it. Yeah, no, it sounds, uh, you know, uh, one of the things that um, I guess the uh, uh, Chinese communities, uh, particularly here in Hong Kong, say, or in China or in uh, uh, Chinese communities around the world is, is there, uh, many Chinese are entrepreneurs, business people. And, and so you, you're an entrepreneur, a, a kind of uh, in, a, an innovator, a disruptor. Um, what, what is your advice to budding entrepreneurs out there, especially those who are entering higher education right now or have just left school and are confronted by this uncertain and, and, and difficult, even dangerous world? I think that, you know, Chinese are entrepreneurs and uh, that's probably the most entrepreneur nation in, in the world. And this is like, a, I think, the best compliment any country can get. Uh, I think that um, when, I, when I meet young, young people, I think that uh, I tell them first, if you have an idea, if you have a great idea, follow it, one. Second, never give up. You know, when you look, when you look, um, when you look at, uh, at people who succeed in life, 
it doesn't come without difficulties and it doesn't come without without failure now the question eventually is not if you failed and if it's not if you had difficulty if you persist and you never give up you will succeed eventually yes look always for what you what you have done wrong and what might go wrong and you know i told you earlier that the main challenge is building yourself for the future. And building yourself for the future is that if you have an idea, think how to make it happen, work on it, and look what might go, go wrong. Because if it goes wrong, you're ready for it. And if it doesn't go wrong, you're lucky. So, you know, you don't need to deal with difficulties. But I think that uh, follow your dreams and continue, continue, and, and, don't ever give up try to make it and if you are Chinese and I don't need to tell it to any Chinese don't look beyond China to the rest of the world because the world can learn from you Chinese and they should there is a lot to learn from you now the pandemic almost seems like this is the moment for the University of the people it's almost as if you were created you know 2009 almost right for this time where online education is really uh, become so important. Um, what's next then for uh, University of the People? Uh, where, where you, you mentioned you have just launched an Arabic um, uh, programs. Um, what, what do you see, where, where, where is the University of People heading? Uh, well, the simple answer is that uh, I believe that every person in the world deserves the opportunity for higher education. And we build a model to show that it can be done. And we are going to grow and grow and grow until others will pick up what we do and continue it. Until one day we wake up in the morning and see that the entire world Every single person who deserves higher education get the opportunity, and then there is no need for us. Then we can stop, go to sleep, and wake up with a new dream. But until then, that's what we will continue doing. While we're doing it, uh, we would love to help other, others to do the same. We would love to show universities how higher education can be accessible and with the right the right quality because when you think about it and we talked about all the people that help the university who are these professors and, and people they're coming from other universities so if we can do it they can do it as well they need to believe in me they should be less skeptical they should <laughs> stop denying the reality and say well this is the future we should we should join rather than say ah, ah this is not for me so I think that we can help other universities and it is our role to make sure that other universities will do it, other governments. You know, you look at Africa and every single country in Africa do not have enough seats for the local, for the local students. Take Nigeria as an example. It's a big country, but still, every year, there are one and a half million students who pass the university entrance exams, which means that one and a half million students are qualified for higher education. But there are seats available only for half a million. That means wow. that literally one million students qualified for higher education are being denied. This is a lost generation. Now, how many universities do they need to build in order to serve these million people? Or they can do what we do. We can take million students in a couple of months. So there is a solution, and that's the way to educate the world, a fast way, quality way, which will bring the world uh, um, fast forward. And I think that that's our role, to make sure that the world will do it as well, the entire world, because we will have, having the entire world being educated, we'll have a different world. I, I also believe that we will have a more peaceful world, but that's a different discussion. Yes. Now, um Finally, uh, Shai, and thank you for uh, being very generous with your time. Um, I ask all our contributors this these days, um, how are you doing during the pandemic? Uh, how is your family doing? Are you uh, keeping well? I'm doing very well. My family is doing well. 
the only thing is that I'm working 16 hours a day because I'm on Zoom all day. <laughs> right. I work yeah. harder than I worked before, but no complaints. I'm not complaining. It's great. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's good. And uh, clearly you're keeping your good spirits as well. So sure, it's, no very nice. <laughs> it's very nice to see you. Thank you very much, Shai. You've been very generous with your time. Very insightful. Um, thank you very much. I commend uh, Shai's article to our readers. Find it on Asia Global Online. Follow Asia Global Institute and Asia Global Online by coming to our website and registering. And follow us on social media, Twitter, LinkedIn, YouTube. You know the drill. Thank you very much, Shai. Lovely to thank see you. you. And thank you for inviting me. It was great talking to you yes. and uh, well done. Thank you. Yeah, cheers. Thanks so much. Cheers. Bye.